Hey, good morning. Good morning. Well, today is Resurrection Day, which we also commonly refer to as Easter. You know, there's some who think we shouldn't do that, uh, but Easter is a Bible word, even if it is talking about the pagan Gentiles when it's referred to. But, you know, in my mind, there is no difference. The thing we want to do is to think about who are we celebrating? What are we celebrating? Uh, one of the first things Sherry said to me this morning, she says, now, you know, if I fall asleep, don't think anything about it. And I says, well, both of us can't be taking a nap during my message. <laughs> uh, but I'd planned a nap about halfway through, so. But it's a great day, and it's a great opportunity and message. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 to 4. Today we want to consider the question, uh, did the angel in the tomb lie about Jesus? 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and where ye wherein ye stand, by which also ye were saved, if ye keep in memory what I have preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. Let's pray. Father, what a wonderful day to think about all that the Lord Jesus Christ went through as he went to Calvary, how he was rejected, shamed, humiliated, punished, had a crown of thorns jammed on his head, nailed to a cross, had a spear jammed into his side. But the things that we truly appreciate was the fact that he died for our sins, that he was qualified, able, willing to go through that for us. And for that, we give you praise and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, of course, today there are Christians, and this is one of the most significant days of the year, not just for them, but for everyone. Because this is the day that we literally celebrate the resurrection <clears throat> of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's true that he died for us, isn't it? It's true that they buried him. All of that would be meaningless. We can appreciate his willingness to die and to suffer all of that. But the fact that he was buried, well, of course that happens when people die. But what makes his death, his burial, special, important, was, as we sang, it was up from the grave he arose. Mighty victor or his foes. You know, it's a fantastic thing. So today is a day when believers can remember all the days of Christ's life. All that led up to his crucifixion thereby remembering the real reason that Christ had to go to Calvary. And the real reason that Christ had to go to Calvary was to pay the price for sin. Now, it meant some dispensational differences a little bit along the way, what it accomplished. But the main purpose was the fact <clears throat> that through His shed blood, He was able to pay a ransom for our soul, paid incomplete, paid in full. And who, who was he paying? Who was he trying to satisfy? Well, he had to satisfy the offended righteousness of his father. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. 
for all have sinned. Now, you know, I've actually run across some people in the past who wanted to argue with me. Because in their mind, they're thinking that sin is just the horrendous things that we see that men can do. But from God's perspective, the sin we commit is coming short of His glory. We don't measure up to His righteousness. He is absolute righteous. We are not. So that means we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. So we remember His death, His burial, His resurrection. We remember, but then we celebrate because Christ arose from the sin. And in doing so, the power of sin, of course, which is death, is rendered powerless. Now, certainly we know we're not talking about physical death. We're not talking about being able to overcome the effect of sin on these sin-cursed bodies. As I like to say, living in our as yet unredeemed bodies. Because I look forward to that day. You know, I get what will it be like to wake up and not even have a stiff joint? <laughs> I tell you what, Centerwell Pharmacy is going to wonder what happened to Fred? Where is he? We got him on automatic shipments for crying out loud. <laughs> oh, but what a day it will be, and I know many of us look forward to that. But the grave could not conceal him any longer. You know, Christ's resurrection proves what God's Word says when He says that we can have eternal life. Now, everybody that has a soul, and I guarantee everyone in here does, is going to live somewhere for eternity. You know, back, way back in Genesis chapter 2, I'm off to say, when God created man, He breathed the breath, He breathed breath into man, and man became a living soul. It's your soul that's going to live somewhere for eternity. These bodies are going to wear out. They're going to become useless. If we die and we're put in the grave, they're going to just turn back to dust. But not the soul. The soul is going to come and the soul will be with us forever. You know, from the human perspective, the cross is really a tragedy because the cross is the result of the complete rejection of uh, the Lord Jesus Christ by Israel. And I tell you, the existence, the physical existence of Christ had to be one of the most taxing things that he did because he was rejected. Rejected specifically from those that he came to. And when he came, early in his earthly ministry, he came to the nation of Israel. John chapter 1 says in verse 11, He came unto his own, that's, that's Israel, and his own received him not. I mean, he came to them. He came to be their prophet, their priest, their king. He came to bring in all the physical promises of the kingdom that had been promised beginning way back with Abraham. And when he got here, people rejected him. You know, and what we learn from that is that only a sovereign God could take such an atrocity and have good come from it. You know, from the human perspective, we would have said, wow, that didn't work out like we planned. What are we going to do now? But God took the rejection of the Lord Jesus Christ by His own people, 
Israel, and he's going to have good come from it. Doesn't look good now, <clears throat> but he's going to have good from it. Christ had come to Israel to be their king and to bring in and fulfill all the promises that uh, God had made. Now, so that they don't miss out on the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, God sends a forerunner. His name is John the Baptist. And John the Baptist was the first one to come and to announce, and he had an un... I mean, his message, you couldn't misunderstand what he had to say. Because he said, repent, change your mind, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And what had God been promising? He'd been promising the kingdom of heaven here on earth. He says the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He says that it won't be long. That Christ will be in your midst. He's going to walk around. He's going to go through the land. But instead of receiving him, he was betrayed by the ones that he loved that he came to. Beaten, scourged, scorned, humiliated. You know, there's a certain denomination that depicts the dying of Christ at Calvary as 12 stations around the cross. And it's during that period of time, all that is counted as payment for sin. But there's not one scourge. There was not one nasty thing said. There's not one piece of hair yanked out of his beard. It's not one sin that was ever paid for by the gall they gave him to drink. You know what, again, what pays for sin is the death of one who is qualified to pay for it. That's why there have been many men who would die for other people. I mean, but... You can't die for me to pay for my sin. You could die for me and give me a few extra years of life, and I could for you. But it wouldn't help as far as where we spend eternity. Up to this point, Jesus had been teaching and training his disciples. They'd been going out, walking to and fro in the land, and in so demonstrating this is, this is the land that this is all about. About him going to be able to come and take control of it. And what they did when they were going through the land, and who were they trying to, to let know? Satan. What is Satan known for? Well, he says, walking to and fro in the earth. <laughs> and that's when he goes back up to see God and says, I got a guy I want to run a test on. His name is Job. That can't happen today. It won't happen today. So if you're afflicted, it's not Satan made an agreement with God <laughs> to come and, and bring you harm. But they went throughout the land. His disciples went with him, healing the sick, raising the dead, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And that's what the gospel was called during the earthly ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. It was a promise being fulfilled where they could literally go in uh, and take possession. And what a blessing that could have been for them. But they rejected Christ. You know, Christ had before told his disciples of his pending death, how he's, the Gentiles were going to treat him. But they didn't understand. Come to Luke 18. Luke 18, verse 31. Luke 18, verse 31. Speaking about Christ, 
Then he, that's Christ, took unto him the twelve, that was his disciples, and said unto them, Behold, we go up into Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. What things? For he shall be delivered unto the Gentiles, and shall be mocked, and spitefully entreated, and spitted on, and they shall scourge him, and put him to death. And the third day, he shall rise again. Now, speaking of the disciples, verse 34, and they understood none of these things. And this saying was hid from them. Neither knew they the things which were spoken. Were they just simply dull mentally? Did you misunderstood what was being said about the Lord in those verses, about all He's going to go through and happen to them? And there was not one thing He said to them that they understood. Why? Because these things were hid from them. It wasn't time for them to know. It's time for us to know. But right then and there, it wasn't time for them to know what if they would have hatched a plan that would foil the Roman government and the religious leaders from being able to accomplish what needed to be accomplished? It's only after the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ that the Lord, during one of his times with them, opened their eyes and they said, Oh, now we understand. Now we know. And now the Lord Jesus Christ had been rejected by the, uh, the uh, nation, especially the religious leaders now. There was a time when there was a great number of common people. They saw him. They followed him around. They saw the miracles. They heard what was being said by him. They knew the Old Testament references that said, only your Messiah will be able to do these things. But then the hatred and envy of the religious leaders became so powerful. One of the things that they did, the religious leaders, was they began to persecute themselves, those that were following the Lord Jesus Christ. Peter, as we know, Peter was a very outspoken person. He called him aside one day and said, you stop talking about this Jesus. You know, maybe we should have entitled this was Peter a liar. But this is in a, in a good way because Peter said, okay. And what did he do? He couldn't help himself. He, he was just back out and talking about his Lord. But the religious leaders having... You know, they, it, their hatred is progressing. Their envy is progressing. And they've already made a decision to kill the Lord, but they n desperately need to come up with a plan. Come to Mark chapter 14. Mark chapter 14. And verse 1. Mark 14, verse 1, After two days was the feast of the Passover and of unleavened bread. And the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might take him, that's the Lord, by craft and put him to death. But they said, no, not on the feast day, lest there be an uproar of the people. So plenty of them, plenty of people still were following him, and they said, man, we... We take him on a feast day. We're going to offend somebody. There's probably going to be an uproar. But the thing we want to learn is in verse 2. I mean, verse 1. And the scribes sought how they might take him by craft. Craft is trickery. How can we trick some people into us being able 
to take the Lord Jesus Christ and put him to death. You see, they worried about things like that because they knew they had no valid reason to call for Christ's death. So they need to come up with this plan that in that will justify their actions. But things also had to be at the right time. That's why we say in verse 2. But they... But they said, not on the feast day. Well, I mean, how many other days during the year are they going to have? But they want to do it right now. They're, they don't want to wait. They need a plan and need to come up with one that Christ's own disciples, where one of Christ's own disciples would betray him. Come to verse 10. I bet you all know who it is. Verse 10, and Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve went unto the chief priest to betray him unto them. When they heard it, they were glad and promised to give him money. And he saw how he might conveniently betray him. Though he certainly wants it to be convenient, you know, a time which would be opportune for them to come and to do that. So the night before Christ was crucified, Christ and his disciples are preparing to have their last Passover meal together. After which, he and his disciples would go to the Garden of Gethsemane. And that's where Christ, when he's praying to his Father, would sweat, as it were, great drops of blood. Which just says there was torment pain of thought in his soul. But they go to Gethsemane to pray. Go Come down to verse 32. And they came to a place which was named Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I shall pray. And he taketh with him Peter and James and John, and began to be sore amazed and to be very heavy. And saith unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful unto death. Tear ye here and watch. And what happened? He goes off and he prays. And this is why I thought it might be appropriate to fall asleep. I mean, <laughs> we're no better than the disciples were. <laughs> Jesus was praying and what were they doing? they have been up a long time. They as well. And he comes back, finds him asleep, and wakes him up, and he goes and prays again. And he comes back, finds him asleep, and the third time. You know, we're beginning to get a picture that will be demonstrated completely at the crucifixion. Christ was in this alone. He didn't have any help, no support. I mean, even his disciples couldn't tarry one hour as he went and prayed. He's all by himself. So the religious leaders, and they we know what's going to happen. Come down to verse, maybe 53, let's see. Let's back up, we'll come to... Christ knows that Judas is going to come, and we'll start in verse 43. And immediately when he yet spake, cometh Judas, one of the twelve, and with him a great multitude with swords and staves from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. And he that betrayed him had given them a token, saying, Whomsoever I shall kiss, that same is he. Take and lead him away. I love this word, safely. Well, he's not worried about Christ's safety. <laughs> he's worried about their own. And as soon as he was come, he goeth straightway to him and saith, Master, Master, and kissed him. And they laid their hands on him and took him. And one of them that stood by drew a sword and smote a servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. 
other passages tell us who that was. That was Peter. And the Lord performs a miracle, doesn't he? He takes that cut off here and just puts it right back on. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Are ye come out as against a thief with swords and staves to take me? I was daily with you in the temple teaching, and you took me not, but the scriptures might be fulfilled. And they all forsook him and fled. Every single one of them. Once again, he's left alone. They were fearing for their lives. Perhaps added to the fervor was the fact that Peter cut off one of the soldiers' ears. But the fact is, they departed and they left the Lord Jesus Christ to deal on his arrest all by himself. And when they take the Lord, come to verse 53. And they led Jesus away to the high priest, and with him were assembled all the chief priests and elders and the scribes. And Peter followed him afar off, even into the palace of the high priest. And he sat with the servants and warmed himself at the fire. And the chief priest and all the council sought for witnesses, for witness against Jesus to put him to death and found none. For many bear false witness against him, but their witness agreed not together, and there arose certain and bare false witness against them, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and within three days I will build another made without hands. But neither so did the witnesses agree together. And the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, saying, Answers thou nothing? What is it with these witnesses against thee. But he held his peace and answered nothing. Again, the high priest asked him and said unto him, Art thou the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus said, I am. And ye shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. The high priest and when he did this, then the high priest rent his clothes and saith, What need we any further witness? Ye have heard the blasphemy. What think ye? And they all condemned him to be guilty of death. And some began to spit on him. And then the physical abuse begins. So why would the Lord Jesus, why would the religious leaders be so against the Lord Jesus Christ. Come to Mark chapter 15. Mark chapter 15. Mark 15 and verse 10. For he knew that the chief priest had delivered him for envy. Oh boy, that, that don't ever think that the simple things we think about can be, be benign. They can become very vicious. They envied the Lord Jesus Christ, but they mistakenly envied the Lord Jesus Christ. Come to Matthew chapter 9. Because when the Lord Jesus Christ first came to Israel, he came to the religious leaders. Matthew chapter 9 and verse 38. Matthew chapter 9 and verse 38. Come back to 32, sorry. And as they went out, Christ and his disciples, verse 32, Behold, they brought to him a dumb man possessed with a devil. And when the devil was cast out, the dumb spake, and the multitudes marveled, answering, It was never so seen in Israel. But the Pharisee saith, He casteth out devils through the prince of devils. And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, 
and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitude, and that's going to be the Gentiles, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Well, he's no longer talking about God sending or the religious leaders coming to grips and going. he's moving on. And who's he going to move over to? Moving to, forward to, verse, chapter 10, verse 1. And we had called unto him his 12 disciples. He gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out, to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Then he names them. And verse 5, These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles and into any city of the Samaritans, and you not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. And how will they know this? They're to heal the sick, cleanse the leper, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely ye have received, freely give, and so forth. Well, many people get waylaid by the one spot in that verse where it says, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and enter ye not in the city of Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But God knew what was best for that time. Right now he's got 12 disciples. But what if they went and Israel would uh, hear the message to repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Your Messiah is here. Believe that Jesus was the Christ. And then, as a nation of believers, they could go all the way, the whole nation, be turned loose on the Gentiles, and many, many more souls would have opportunity to be saved. And there was a lot of conflict between the religious leaders of Israel and the Lord Jesus Christ. They opposed and they denied the miracles of Christ. Oh, he did that by Beelzebub, and Beelzebub's not the good guy. He's part of the prince of devils. He gets his power from Satan. And so what do we want to think? Come to Matthew chapter 15. Matthew chapter 15. And verse 1. You know, I can understand from the human side of the equation why the religious leaders were offended by Christ because he goes right after them. Matthew 15, verse 1, Then came to Jesus scribes and Pharisees which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat. But he answered and said unto them, why do you also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? For God commanded, saying, Honor thy father and mother, and he that calls curseth father and mother, let him die the death. But ye say, Who shall ever say to his father or his mother, It is a gift. A gift for what? <laughs> I'm your child, man. That's all it's going to... I mean, you couldn't get any more than that, could you? My being your child is a gift. By whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, and honor not his father or his mother, he shall be free. That's what they were thinking. Thus have ye made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. Ye hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, this people drawing nigh unto me with their mouth and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. 
but in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. See, they, they were pretending that they were the spiritual leaders of the nation of Israel. But they were just men's commandments. They weren't even the commandments of the Lord. So Christ speaks to them. And we remember that it was an issue of envy. Come to Matthew chapter 21. Matthew 21, verse 23. And when he, Matthew 21, 23. And when he was come into the temple, the chief priest and the elders of the people came unto him as he was teaching and said, By what authority doest thou these things? And who gave thee this authority? And Jesus answered and said unto them, I also will ask you one thing, which if ye tell me, I in likewise will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John. Whence was it? From heaven or of men? And they reasoned with themselves, saying, If we shall say from heaven, he will say unto us, why did ye not then believe him? But if we shall say of men, we fear the people, for all hold John as a prophet. And they answered and said, We cannot tell. And he said unto them, Neither tell I you by what authority I do these things. I'm assuming they weren't very happy with the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the second occasion that he utterly made them look ridiculous. He outwitted them. They thought they could outwit him. <laughs> they send their best lawyers. They're the great orators. And the Lord just simply makes mincemeat out of them. And now Christ is going to bring this exchange to an end. Come to verse 43. Matthew 21, verse 43. Therefore say I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth fruit, bringing forth the fruits thereof. And whosoever shall fall on the stone shall be broken, speaking of himself. But on whosoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. And when the chief priests and the Pharisees heard these his parables, they perceived that he spake of them. <laughs> but when they sought to lay hands on him, they feared the multitude because they took him for a prophet. You know, the greatest of insult was probably right there at the last. I'm going to take the kingdom away from you, and I, the one with the power, with the authority, I will give it to someone else. He said, I'll give it to a nation. Perhaps one of the biggest misunderstanding about who is being talked about here, the nation that he's going to give, is to believe that he was talking about the Gentiles. But there are several reasons why we know that he wasn't talking about the Gentiles. And one is the Gentiles, every time they're referred to, they're going to be refer referred to as nations, plural. But when it's talking about Israel, it's going to be talking about a nation, singular. And Christ said, I'm going to give it to a nation bringing forth fruit. The question then would be, who in Israel will the authority of the kingdom be given to? Let's start out just by going to the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 10.
Paul's going to quote Isaiah the prophet, Romans chapter 10, verse 16. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah, that's Isaiah, saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? So then faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily. Their sound went into all the earth, and their words unto the end of the world. But I say, did not Israel know? First Moses, Moses saith, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people, and by a foolish nation I will anger you. Now, in what way were the twelve disciples not a people? The fact is they were being rejected by the religious leaders. They said, you're nothing, you're, you're not even a people. But he's going to make he can provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people, and by a foolish nation will I anger you. You know what we're talking about here is the little flock. Peter talks about being a chosen generation, a generation of people, foolish nation chosen to provoke Israel along with the religious leaders to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. But boy, they're hard. They didn't do it. But who was Christ looking with? You know, this foolish nation does get an identifiable title. Come to Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. And verse 32. Christ is going to identify the foolish nation right here. And he says to them, Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Then he's going to tell them, I tell you, it's a good thing we're not being called to be part of the little flock today. Because if the little flock was still in existence, look what our, our instructions would be. Verse 33. Sell that you have and give alms, providing yourselves bags which wax not old, a treasure in the heavens that faileth not, where neither thief approaches, neither the mouth corrupteth. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And so forth. How many people would be comfortable joining the little flock today? We will have a deed ceremony next week. Anybody wants to bring me the deed to their house? Don't bring me a mortgage. <laughs> no, I'm not willing to take over mortgages. <laughs> but I'm sure the board would put your property to good use. Like charging you rent. But that's what it would be. Sell all that you have and give on. Start giving it away. There's not going to be anything that you need. When will be the time dispensationally when men don't need physical things any longer? It's when Christ is sitting on His throne. Money won't be needed. During that period of time, and on out through eternity, our provisions physically, emotionally, spiritually, will all be taken care of. But that didn't happen. They, many of, they sold all they had. They became part of the little flock. And... You know, we get into Paul and finding out what happened to Israel. I mean, there were such great plans, but where's Israel? People were asking that back. Peter wanted to ask Peter, you know, what's going on, Peter? Things have stayed the same since the fathers. 
And people mocked Peter because his message was about Christ's return to the earth right now. But Paul's got a different slant on it because dispensationally things have changed. We don't look for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ because the dispensation of the kingdom has been interrupted for the dispensation of the grace of God. All the kingdom promises have been put aside until the catching away of the church, the body of Christ. And then it will begin again. But what about all those that sold in anticipation <laughs> of the kingdom coming as was promised? You remember that little thing in Romans where Paul is taking up a collection for the poor saints at Jerusalem? Why were they poor? They had given it all away. You know, as we think about those that crucified the Lord Jesus Christ, those that were part of his part of the accusations and the burial and so forth. The big thing we focus on though today is of course his resurrection. Come to Mark chapter 16. And beginning in verse 1. And when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and uh, Salome, had brought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him, that's Christ. And very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came unto the sepulcher at the rising of the sun, and they said among themselves, who shall roll away the stone from the door of the sepulcher? And when they looked, they saw that the stone was rolled away, for it was very great. And entering into the sepulcher, they saw a young man sitting on the right side clothed in a long white garment, and they were affrighted. And he said unto them, Be not affrighted, or scared to death, Ye seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. Well, that had to be a tremendous shock, didn't it? What had been telling them, though? They're going to kill me. I'll be raised again the third day. Now, this guy sitting in the tomb, he's the angel. Have you ever known of any angel other than Satan and his minions tell a lie? I mean, that would be a lie. If he had not risen, come and see the place where he laid. He's not here. Why? Because he's risen from the dead. The stories, the rumors, the controversies that go on about one says, well, he never died. Well, did he? Yeah. Some say he never did. He was just unconscious. And when he went and they laid him in the tomb, he revived. Maybe the biggest one and the greatest one, though, is that somebody stole the body. <laughs> He didn't raise from the dead. There was someone that came along and stole his body. But come to Matthew 28. Matthew 28. Anybody ever fallen for that one? Man. I mean, that would been that would not have been a hard one. I mean, if you've been listening even a little bit to what the Lord said, if we've read our Bibles and believe the story of the crucifixion, the story of His earthly ministry, the story, the information about His death, burial, and resurrection. Matthew 28, 
and verse 11. The Roman government, along with the nation of Israel, of course, knew that they had, they had a problem on their hands. How were they going to explain this? Now, the soldier, they all come back and they look. Soldiers now are aware. It's now when they were going, behold, some of the watch came into the city and showed unto the chief priest all the things that were done. And when they were assembled with the elders and had taken counsel, they gave large money unto the soldiers, saying, Say ye, his disciples came by night and stole him away while we slept. <coughs> Which I guess it should have been a lot of money because that should have put them on a death watch, <laughs> their own death. But they said, no, we'll, we won't kill you. Here, take this large sum of money. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will persuade him and secure you. So they, the soldiers took the money and did as they were taught, and this saying is commonly reported among the Jews until this day. Well, I trust now it's commonly reported and portrayed through believers, members of the church, the body of Christ. We need an understanding. Seems like a foolish question to me. Well, what happened to the body? Because we believe he rose from the dead. But skeptical people are going to believe that somebody stole it, something happened to it, whatever. But what we learn from this, did the angel lie about the resurrection? He's, he's risen, he said. And we know now the angel didn't lie. The Roman government lied, the elders lied, and the soldiers lied. But praise the Lord, we belong to a God which cannot lie. Praise the Lord, let's pray. <coughs> Father, we pray as there's anyone here today online or wherever who has never come to that humble place of recognition that they're, they're just not perfect. And have never trusted in the complete payment of sin by the death, the burial, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. We praise God. He was willing to go to Calvary but we praise your name that you accepted his payment, noted by the resurrection. But to understand that this is just, it's a gift. Something that you cannot earn by, it's not a reward, it's a gift. If there's anyone today that's never fully trusted Christ as their Savior. We pray they'll do so right now. And we want to thank you for your love for us being so great that you're willing to allow your son to go through all that for us based on your love. And we love you and praise you and want to give you the all the honor and glory do you, and it's in the name of your Son and our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.